This is a free podcast from the BBC. For more information, you can go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio2. And for it is Christmas morning. Oh, let joy be unconfined. Down joy. Oh, have I got a programme for you? Well, have you got a programme? Yes, I have. And, of course, as always, <laughs> in a desperate effort to keep you listening, I shall be making all sorts of wild promises. But this will happen. Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor will be here to help us pause for thought. Just a moment in your busy turkey cooking day. Janet and John. A little tale of simple, homely folk. There'll be an exotic films panto, which will uh, test your endurance. And then our tribute to Mrs. Gaskell, Scranford. For those still missing Miss Matty and Miss Deborah and the mob-capped ladies of Cranford. Yeah, so here we are, gathered on Christmas morning. We'll be trundling on, myself and old Barrel Arms and Gazza and, and, and Deadly and Johnny and all in... For your entertainment, if I'm not pushing the boat too far out, on Christmas Day, I must say I can't wait for Christmas Day and your much-heralded live broadcast punctuated with music, full mouths, and eating a slurping of drink, smoochy pecks under the mistletoe, and other festive frolics. That'll be us, then. The Wogan mob gathered round the tree, ready for some festive jollity, for Baron Lickspittle, dressed in moleskin of note, on Yuletide provender, had pushed out the boat, and to add a bit of sparkle this year, his minions were dressed in pantomime gear, how true that is, Linderella, resplendent in grease-smeared gown, and plexiglass Doc Martin she'd picked up and down, Fairy Godfrey Mum, knocked up a nice line in carriages, from a few nicks and knacks she'd pilfered from Claridge's. The fashionista, as usual, were being quite harsh about the foppish extravagances of Dan Deeney Marsh. Chazanov was his usual bag of woes, for his buttons cosy had only zips and bows, and Dame Leslie was causing a few goggle eyes. Prince charmingly slapped her fish-netted thighs, Jezza Vine. And Ken Bruce came to blows, of course, over... Who got which end of the pantomime horse? But those ugliest of siblings, Deadly and Beryl, were putting sentient life into this planet in peril. For, with those two around, the question most burning, what possible sight could be more stomach-churning? So thank goodness every child was tucked up in bed, excitedly waiting. Santa's reindeer and sled. He's been and gone. Ah, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Cheezer, for the doubters who don't believe that you and your producer are at your posts. Could anything be more live? And giving of your all this morning, let me prove you indeed are. Please play a record for all of us here at Scrimper and Scraper Attorneys. We're busy drawing up documents and papers that will scupper people's New Year's, and we get them into the post as soon as those postal types can be bothered to get back to work. Something cheerful, please. Possibly something like I don't like Mondays. (laughs) Season's greetings to you, Ebenezer. Bah! Humbug! Ah, Christmas Day's going great guns here in the Nylon household. Ah, thank you for taking the time and trouble, Bry, in the middle of what must be a busy day for all of us. The present Mrs. Nylon has now found I wasn't joking when I'd been telling her I just couldn't think of anything nice to get her. Yes, I don't know, you're very hard to buy for. The backup plan of some expensive face cream complete with Derma Hormone Juvenitius. Yeah, I know. Made in a shack somewhere south of Limoges, was met with the retort, I must think she's looking old. Oh, God. Yeah, and don't tell me about does me bomb look big in this, of which the answer is always no. And the cookery book, oh dear, of course it wasn't a statement about her culinary expertise, it's going to be a quiet rest of the day here, methinks. I'll roll on the afternoon nap, Bry. My sister, Isabel, uh, not Isabel necessarily on a bike, no, Anne. And, sister, just about says it all. Christmas is coming. The goose has got the flu. Better have a turkey. Oh, no, it's got it, too. Better stick to beef. Oh, no, his tongue's gone all blue. <laughs> Let's be a vegetarian. Ah, uh, hopefully Lady Wogan has packed you off this morning with an adequate hamper to keep you going. James Burton Stewart, she is all generosity at this time of the year. We three kings disorientated are. We followed our sat-nav instead of a star. Be with you as soon as we are able, if someone can get the postcode of the stable. The roads are quite bad and in places quite steep. We're having some trouble. (laughs) Too many sheep. It's all before us. We've only just started, and I hope you're enjoying it so far. It'll get better. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, as long as you don't pick at it. 
Now, uh, the good Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor will begin very shortly. Give us the benefit of his keen brain and fine-sounding talk as we pause for thought. And then, a little bit later on, I won't tease you by telling you when, we shall have a Janet and John tale to further uplift the Christmas morn. And then Scranford, a reworking of Mrs Gaskell's fine work. <sighs> Abuse, really, I suppose you could call it. And there'll be much more, much more to entertain. There's an exotic film's um, panto. <laughs> I know, I know, but look, we're doing our best. Good morning, good-looking. Reasons why Santa can't possibly be a man, says Lollipop. Look, Lolly, you've given me enough trouble during the year. Men can't pack a bag. Men would rather be dead than be caught wearing red velvet. <laughs> See little Johnny Marsh a little later on. Men would feel their masculinity is threatened. And we've been seen with all those elves. Men don't answer their mail. Men would refuse to allow their physique to be described even in jest as anything remotely resembling a bowl full of jelly. Men aren't interested in stockings unless somebody else is wearing them. And having to do the ho-ho-ho would seriously inhabit their ability to pick up the women. And finally, being responsible for Christmas would require some kind of commitment. Oh, lollipop. <laughs> the bitter word. Even on Christmas Day. Here's a message for your Christmas... I mean, back... I'm sorry, uh, Chuffer. Chuffer Dandridge, the old Shakespearean actor-manager. Still awaiting the old white fiver that Larry borrowed from him all those years ago at Wyndham's. What ho, me old plump geese and plum duffs. Hope the show's going... I'm saying these lines along with you at home, just to show <laughs> my support. Live performances should always be encouraged. Thank you, Chuffer. I thought I'd share a few reminiscences of Christmas and Panto with you and your eager audience. Oh, my first success in Panto was with my groundbreaking one-man outdoor Panto back in the 50s. I played all the parts myself. Of course, I had to change costume in shop doorways and public conveniences. <laughs> When you when you go into a gents as the Demon King and come out as a principal boy in tights and sequin tunic, you get some unwelcome attention. People queued for hours when I performed the show. Admittedly, they were queuing for cinemas and buses, but I gave them my all. I remember I followed one poor chap all the way home <laughs> on a bus to Shoreditch, just so he could see the end. He was so impressed he called the police. I was able to perform the entire show in the local police station later that same night. I also got a free Christmas dinner in the cells the next day. They don't stint in Shoreditch. I did a nude panto in the 70s. A pantomime horse is just not the same if it's just two chorus boys on all fours. We did get a big audience, but it was mostly fellow theatricals, turning out just to support us. Ah, the old spirit. Now, I shouldn't wonder. Word of advice, if you're doing a nude panto, don't overdo the old holly and the ivy when it comes to set decoration. This year, I had an appointment to go to Midnight Mass with my old chum Dicky Touch Tingles, but he let me down. There I was, twelve o'clock, and no sign of Dicky. But... <laughs> As I was leaving, he appeared and whisked me into the organist's alcove. Um, never without a hip flask is Dickie. May I wish all in the light program at home and overseas, and all who tread the boards, a Merry Christmas and a New Year in full employment. Cardinal Murphy O'Connor is with us, a good friend of mine and the Archbishop of Westminster, and a man who is fairly busy today. So, a happy Christmas to you. Well, Terry, a happy Christmas to you, and indeed to all the, your listeners today. I'm really delighted oh, I'm to glad, be on, so glad you could find on, the your, on your program. You know, one of the things that makes Christmas special is to be remembered by our friends. The cards you receive, the gifts, are annual reminders of appreciation and friendship. It doesn't really matter what the gift is or how expensive it is. We might receive a book we'll never read, or a perfume we don't like, um, though I don't normally receive <laughs> perfumes or whatever. And for the last 30 years, I've received a bottle of wine from an old friend. It's not very good wine. In fact, it's, it's kind of plonk, but it doesn't matter. It's nice to be remembered. And if we're remembered by others, we must never, never forget that the deepest thoughts of joy at Christmas time is that we are all, each one of us, remembered by God. Our love for each other is but a human reflection of God's love for us. While we have many things, food and drink and much to live on, what we really crave is to love and to be loved. And ultimately, we find that in God. I want to wish you today a very, very happy Christmas. And I will pray for you all this Christmas that it will be a time of happiness and joy for you and your families. You see, when I wish you a happy Christmas, I'm really wishing you joy, something much deeper than pleasure 
or a good time, or the presents you receive, or even your family get-together, important, crucially important as that is. No, I'm wishing you the joy of a share in a gift, the gift of God to you, and that involves an interior happiness, a joy in the present moment and a hope for the future. And God is the source of that joy and that hope, a God who has a human face. Open the door of your heart to him this Christmas by prayer and true generosity to others. Yes, open your heart to him. What is it the angel said? I bring you news of great joy, a joy to be shared by the whole people. Today, in the town of Bay David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Thank you, Colin. Will you have any chance at all to, to share a little bit of turkey and the odd chipolata? <laughs> well, indeed I will. Later today I have, you know, I have lunch with uh, all the clergy and the sisters at Archbishop's House, so a little bit of cheer, maybe more. Anyway, good. it's really good to be here. Thank you, Terry. And uh, I'm like, sort of happy Christmas to you especially and your family. And to you and yours. And I can't tell you how pleased I was to hear your mellow tones on the internet. Jeff Warren is another in some foreign field that will be forever England. Mm. My lovely Chinese wife, Crystal. Well, she speaks English, I hope. Good, good. You'll be having the noodles, then. No, they won't. No. Tasty as they may be for Christmas dinner, my wife, a Chinese lady, and uh, is practicing her cooking on me. No such thing as a turkey out here. You can't get a turkey in China. You probably can't get a turkey in Turkey, but you can buy live chickens in the supermarket. What? And you have to kill them yourself. And live fish and live toads. <laughs> Lulu would be so pleased. Everything is so fresh in China at Christmas. And due to health and safety concerns, the following items have had to be banned from the famous song, The Twelve Days. Don't tell me. A loose moral says, The partridge in a pear tree, the two turtle doves, the three French hens, the four calling birds, six geese are laying and seven swans are swimming have been excluded due to fears of bird flu. The twelve drummers drumming and the eleven pipers piping have been found to be a nuisance due to noise pollution. And finally, the ten lords are leaping and the nine ladies dancing were found to be in danger of a misstep and going rear end over lumpy bits. I see. There is some good news. The health and safety brigade, oh, elf in safety, have allowed five golden rings... But give them enough time. I'm sure the Killjoys will find some reason to ban them. And um, neither has this little tale. My friend, Bingo Lil, had a heart attack. Was taken to hospital. And while on the operating the table, she had a near-death experience. And seeing God, she asked, Is my time up? And God said, No, you have another 43 years, two months and eight days to live. Well, God would know that kind of de detail. Upon recovery, Lil decided to stay in the hospital and have a facelift, liposuction, breast implants and a tummy tuck. And she even had someone come in and change her hair colour and brighten up her teeth. And since she had so much more time to live, she figured she might as well make the most of it. So after her last operation, she was released from hospital while crossing the street on her way home, killed by an ambulance. Arriving in front of God, she said, I thought you said I had another 43 years. Why didn't you pull me from out of the path of the ambulance? And he said, sorry, I didn't recognise you. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. It is a Christmas morn here, and from time to time I recount the tales of Christmas Day in the workhouse. This pudding, said the master, is solid, hard and thick. How am I going to cut it? And the man cried, use your penknife, sir, the one with the pearl handle. The mistress asked the vicar to entertain his flock. He said, what would you like to see? And they cried, let's see your conjuring tricks. They're always worth watching. Here's a Christmas story for people having a bad day from Shelaf. Shelaf to go. When four of Santa's elves got sick, the trainee elves didn't produce toys as fast as the regular ones, and Santa began to feel the pre-Christmas pressure. And then Mrs. Claus told Santa her mother was coming to visit, which stressed Santa even more. And then he went to harness the reindeer, and he found that three of them were about to give birth, and two others had jumped the fence and were out heaven knows where. And then he began to load the sleigh, and one of the floorboards cracked, and the toy bag fell to the ground, and all the toys were scattered all over the place and frustrated. Santa went into the house for a couple of a cup of apple cider and a shot of rum, and when he went to the cupboard, he discovered the elves had drank all the cider and hidden the liquor. And in his frustration, he accidentally dropped the cider jug, broke into hundreds of little glass pieces all over the kitchen floor. He went to get the broom and found the meat the mice had eaten all the straw off the end of the broom. And just then the doorbell rang, and irritated, Santa marched to the door, yanked it open, and there stood a little angel with a great big Christmas tree. 
And the angel said, very cheerfully, Merry Christmas, Santa! Isn't this a lovely day? I have a beautiful tree for you. Where would you like me to put it? And so began the tradition of the little angel on top of the Christmas tree. Ah, Johnny, good to see you with us, me old salt. It's a great honour and privilege, as indeed it always is, an entire oh, year. Oh, shut But up, right shut now, it's just especially. Oh, for goodness sake. Just to be here in your presence, Pack it in, my lord, stop. With all the presents oh, from I'm the... sick of it. <laughs> Look, um, have you done anything useful this Christmas week? Do you? Listen, I never uh, did. Did you take out useful. the old organ for a bit of a, a twiddle? I, I did. <laughs> the quick polish, put it back again. Um, but <laughs> I, no, I, I had the extreme privilege of playing for the uh, local primary school's nativity play. And oh, mm, quite. you've never seen anything like it. I think a cross between Scrooge meets Dr. Crippen in Santa's Grotto. <laughs> <laughs> and Scrooge had the most enormous voice. The speakers were all blown off the walls, and of course, you know, other little children speaking very quietly because they're rather frightened about being there. <laughs> so you turn the volume up to get those, and then humbug! <laughs> Everything falls to pieces. The buggy. <laughs> there's a. There's. What about the, what about your boat or ship? Or- the, are you still polishing it? As far as I know, that's still there. Haven't seen it for a couple of weeks. It's probably been towed away or sunk by now. Well, Ron Clark has a a little ode uh, mm. as a tale of caution, thanks to oh, Billy, yes. Billy Bennett, yeah. a poet before our time. The ship's going down and we're all going to drown, shouted Boggy as he stood on the deck. He said, you. I said, I. He said, yes. I said, why? Because I'm a captain and your crew, so there. The ship rocked and rolled, at least that's what I'm told, and a voice shouted, what's to do next? Captain Boggy came through loud and clear. That's obvious, me dear. Change your trousers and don't leave them here. So I swam for the shore to six miles or more and contacted the lifeboatman sharp. Though they launched quickly, I felt rather sickly at the thought of Boggy playing harp. At last they were saved from a watery grave and Boggy then spoke through quivering lips. Come on, chaps, to the boozer. Let's go. And I'll treat you to one or two nips. <laughs> Very good. That's nice. Do you know there's sort of a tradition among boating people, some boating people, yeah, yeah. to go down on Boxing Day and, and cook the Boxing Day meal on the boat. You'll be doing that, will you? Well, Tomorrow? I, I mentioned it to the dear wife. <laughs> Got a very short reply. And a little bit later on, Janet and John. John goes to the office party. Well, Dick, a very Merry Christmas to you. Where are you? I'm sending you this email to try to catch you out to prove that you recorded. Of that there is no doubt. Today is now the 25th. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. I bet that you're still in bed, just waking up and yawning. So if you fail to read this out, it will be no great surprise, for it only goes to show that you were telling lies. And this morning you said, yeah, Christmas games. I'm not big on uh, Christmas games. I remember we always used to get a board game on our Christmas stocking, says Pauline of Great Yarmouth. After Christmas dinner, we'd all have to sit around the table. It's before we had the TV. Who remembers that? And Dad would put on his glasses and try to decipher the rules of the game. <laughs> it always proved difficult. Uh, they were always too complicated, or written originally in Japanese. And after a couple of hours, we'd give up and play three-card brag instead. And overheard in a supermarket by Patty, uh, I'd like to order a turkey. Of course, madam. I'm sorry, we don't we don't have any organic turkeys at present. Oh, are you likely to get some in for Christmas? Oh, I don't think so. You see, it's to do with this aviation flu. Now, later on in the programme, children, through the square window, we shall be having a Janet and John tale, and then an exotic film's panto. I know, I know, but this and anyway, she, you never know. And it wouldn't be the same. Oh, oh, keep that toy quiet. I can't stop it. Don't put it there. For <laughs> goodness sake. I'll put it between my legs. Look, no. we won't do this properly if you're going to fool around, you know. Uh, this is a tribute. What is that? I can't. Stop it. Stop. Shut up. Shh. Keep going. <laughs> Toys, it's a oh, toys. It'll honestly, stop in a minute. It'll stop in a minute. I've been up. I've been up here since three o'clock this morning rehearsing. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Mrs. Gaskell's wonderful, wonderful Cranford, which was such a triumph on BBC Television. Just shut that. <laughs> Father oh, Christmas the, put, up. Put it in the filing cabinet. Put it in the filing cabinet. Get it out of the house. <laughs> Throw another log on the fire. It's only supposed to do it three times. <laughs> well, look, I don't know what it was, <laughs> what but it certainly right. enlivened my Christmas. Oh. Anyway, a tribute to Mrs. Gaskell. Cranford, of course, was such a success. All those oh. women in mob caps it's and rolling the ball under the bed. Very sad, the last episode. And, and I, cried. Miss, I cried in the did middle you, of it. Did you cry? I know, oh. it was emotional. He's very taken. Miss Matty saw him off, didn't she? Oh. With the gunpowder tea. Selling the tea. Yeah. That was excellent. Blew your man's leg off. 
<laughs> was I mean, that what did it? Yeah. By way oh, of yeah. tri- by way of tribute, our little drama, and I like to call it that, <laughs> because it's scarcely be called anything else. Scranford, oh. yes, and. The roles will be played as follows. In a double role, as Dr. Frank Harassum, a junior medico from the Midlands, and Threaves, the major, the major's hard-of-hearing butler, Mr. Alan Dedicote. What? What? Uh, what? Miss Potty Jenkins, a scullery maid from the Principality, Lynn Bowles. Can I do you now, sir? That's very good. <laughs> Lovely. Major Blowout, a wealthy landowner and gourmand, Sir T. Wogan. Hello, hello. <laughs> Very good, very good, yeah. Thank you. That was an ad lib. Well done. Uh, Ricketts. <laughs> <laughs> a down the tea lurchin. Beryl Ann Boyd. How's it going? See, <laughs> quite old for a lurchin, aren't you? Should, should we stop now? Probably. Anyway, at Scranford, it's Christmas, but alas, oh. some comestibles have gone missing. Excuse me, Major, oh, but God. when I was in the pantry... <laughs> Now, stop it. Now, look, I'm doing my best. Get on with it. Excuse me, Major, but when I was in the pantry, I noticed that the leg of mutton and the turkey was missing, sir. Isn't it? Wasn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> ah, zoons and gadzooks. Those tasty morsels were the a centerpiece of our Christmas luncheon. We shall leave no stone unturned to find the miscreant who has purloined them, particularly the plump bird that I had my eye on. What did he say? What did he say? What? Okay, go oh, on. He said somebody's nicked Vanessa Phelps. This is going to. This is really going to tax you. <laughs> Send for the constable. I prefer the Gainsborough myself. <laughs> but if you'll excuse me, I've got to be off on the road. Not so fast, my good doctor. Ooh. What is it that you're barely concealing in the folds of your? <gasps> oh no, Ooh. your frock coat. And what's that all over your waistcoat? Why, it looks like. Turkey mutton. Ooh. Explain yourself, you 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 you, you greedy guts. Ooh, Laura, um, I was only <laughs> keeping God. them. What? I was only keeping them safe until the luncheon, Major. That's it. That's what I was doing. Beautiful. Oh, few, few, few. <laughs> Too many. Of my that is that? Few. <laughs> it says here, few. All right. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Very well, Doctor. I shall let it pass. Bastard! That's all right, then. I'm off on me round. Now, turning to other matters, thank God. What are we to do with the body count in Scranford? We're dropping off the twig round here quicker than the average episode of Midsummer Murders. Well, mate! <laughs> no, it's not him again, is it? Turning the page quietly. I think it's a combination of the croup. The croup and also a murderer who's running amok. A murderer? Oh, running aye, amok. Aye. OK, OK, keep going. Aye, a murderer. Oh, it's you. Oh, I see. God, I thought you were dead. <laughs> I, I shall give it some talk as I nap. I must retire to my bed before festivities commence. Thieves, check below the bed. Here's the ball. All right, I'm going to get son on the head. <laughs> Buffoon, if you'll forgive me, I'll just roll it through now, sir. If I may. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> How did you get in? I don't know. It's, it's something, hasn't it? Doesn't it? Wasn't it? I'm him, isn't it? The murderer! Hey, there's a murderer below the bed. Oh, God. <laughs> Murder by eye! I rather think that the ball has contacted the gazunda, but thankfully the longevity and clarity of the note would indicate to me, even with my deafness, that the vessel is empty. Ah! (laughs) You've only got the one bell. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) The luncheon bell. Shall we go and eat? Oh, Oh, Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas! No sooner has Mariah Carey begun to play on a loop in all our shops. The PC police are on a mission to dull down Christmas. They'll do it over our dead bodies. Not that we didn't die during that panto. Every year we hear stories of fairy lights being deemed a fire hazard or nativity plays adapted to be more culturally diverse. (laughs) The seemingly goodwill gesture of Christmas hasn't escaped. I recently heard a story, says John... uh, where a local PCT couldn't send out a Christmas card with a robin on it, and it was deemed too much of an English icon, and it would potentially... I, no, I don't know. Come on. 
These are the tales that just go a tad too far. They stretch the credibility, and then they turn out to be true. It was this that forced me into designing the PC Christmas card, season's greetings, as inclusive as possible. And on the inside it reads, Please accept with no obligation, implied or implicit, my best wishes for an environmentally conscious, socially responsible, low-stress, non-addictive, gender-neutral celebration of the winter solstice holiday, practiced within the most enjoyable traditions of the religious persuasion or secular practices of your choice, with respect for the religious, secular persuasions and or traditions of others, or their choice not to practice religious or secular traditions at all. And on the outside, the most inclusive nativity scene you ever will see. A wise man walking through a metal detector and a safety in the stable poster. Thrown in a burka, a recycling bin and a father's, indeed mother's, for justice protester. And then you'll more or less get the general idea. A Merry Christmas to you all! Oh. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. Merry all right, all right, oh, okay. Okay, stop. Who is that? Enough. <laughs> Here. No. Well, I didn't know somewhere. you could do that with the bells. It's called Dick and the Beast with Puss in the Woods, Sleeping with Aladdin Boots, and the Beauty of a Beanstalk. The cast <laughs> is as follows. The Baron de Wenceslas, my good self. The Beast in the Woods, Alan Barrowlands Boyd. That's me. <laughs> the, <laughs> the sleeping beauty Helga, the Swedish star of exotic films, still using the same opening line. Oh dear, my clothes have fallen off. <laughs> Jack, Look, I'm doing my best. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. We're well, not looking for miracles here. John, get one. in the part of Jack, John Boggy Marsh, star of exotic films, or in the absence of Boggy, Deadly. No, I'm here. Oh. Anything but Deadly, please. Okay. Oh. Widow Swanky. Well, there's only one part left. Uh, hmm. Who can that be? Hello, darling! You see? <laughs> what? And then uh, there's a one-liner coming in later. Oh, hmm. oh I see. <laughs> it's not that short. <laughs> it's usually, I think, here. Well, the scene opens with the Baron de Wenceslas riding through the forest on the night before Christmas. Yeah, you hear the whippoorwill. He's accompanied... No, it's not. He's accompanied by his faithful page, Dick otherwise known as the Beast in the Woods, and they're searching for a Christmas tree for the Great Hall. The Baron de Wenceslas speaks. <coughs> Come on, my man. I'm looking for a really big one this year. Oh, aren't we all, dairy? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm doing my best, sire, but I tell you, it's murder out here in the oh, snow. <laughs> now, there's one over there. Cut that one down. I'll just get my chopper, sir. Oh! He's behind you! Oh dear, my clothes have fallen off. Not no! now! No! No! Hold it! What? Oh, Hold that? Go on! <laughs> Always oh, wake up! Uh, take, uh, ah! take a cue! So I'm sorry. Uh, um, ha! That's nothing. Come over here and I'll show you my beanstalk. Oh! Where did you get that one from? Well, <laughs> someone gave me some magic beans. <laughs> if there seems to be a hole oh, for God's I'll sake. in my trouser pocket. <laughs> oh dear, my clothes are Oh, for off. heaven's sake, no. Not yet. <laughs> Give me those beans, you buffoon. We can't leave those with a fool like you. You never know what might happen. But what about my beanstalk? Oh! Come oh. with me! <laughs> Come with me, Jack! I'll help you with it! Oh, He's been <laughs> Oh! <laughs> I know, I know. No, touched him. no we, could, me. we could have had Christopher Biggins. <laughs> He's behind you! Oh, yes he is! Oh, yes I am. Timber! He, what is he all... stretched that one out, didn't he? Did he? A bit, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting. What is all the noise here? I am. Ha well, I was having a nice sleep. This is murder. <laughs> oh, I seem to have uh, pricked my finger. Uh, can I sleep with you, Helga? <laughs> oh dear, my clothes have fallen oh, off. No! <laughs> He's behind you. Oh, oh yes, he is. It looks like I'll be taking this tree back on my own then. Hi, I'm Holly and this is Ivy. We are known as the Babes in the Wood. Can we help you back to the castle with your large spruce? Isn't it? Wasn't it? Doesn't it? Oh, oh no, he isn't! Oh, yes, I am. And in response to an overwhelming... Uh, Apathy? Exactly. Yeah. Janet and John. John goes to the office party. 
I'm not skipping, am I? Not Please yet. tell me I'm not, not skipping. Not yet. You may well be gambling. <laughs> today, John is going to the office Christmas party. Trilla. It's the office Christmas party today. Everyone is allowed to go in their own clothes. John takes lots of games and toys with him. A cup and a plate labelled with his name. He puts on his best party clothes. A mauve lurex cat suit with mother-of-pearl sequins, a tiara and a feather boa. John is a fop and a dandy. Did you say lurex? I know that's enough to excite anybody. And Janet says, You'll need a big coat, John. It's very cold today. See, John put on a pink fur coat with ermine lapels and pockets and puts a big book in his pocket for the journey. Janet says, Have a nice time at the party, John. Don't drink too much. Do try to behave. See, John, wave goodbye. Here we go. <laughs> As he hops yes, yes. and skips All down right. the road, catches the train into London. Soon arrives at the office. On the way into the office, John sees John Humphreys. Ooh. John Humphreys is a serious newsreader and works on Radio 4. Mm, he's a real journalist. John used to work on Radio 4. Do you know what an incident is? <laughs> when John grows up, he wants to be just like John Humphreys, only not as Welsh and with less nose hair. <laughs> John... John goes into the newsroom and puts his toys and games in his desk. And when he puts the lid down, he notices someone has written something rude on the lid. Do you know who Leslie Douglas is? John does. <laughs> that rumour is not true. <laughs> there is lots of music, food and fizzy drink. John's friend Alan has laid on all the food, but most of it is still edible. <laughs> he actually laid on it, that's the trouble. <laughs> See the empty amaretto <laughs> bottles and Alan dancing with the coat stand. <laughs> Beryl Ann is handing around the porridge vol au -vents. Soon it's time for party games. Do you know how to play Postman's Knock? John doesn't. See John give, giving people a pretend letter and then asking them for five pounds as it's Christmas. Soon it's time for everyone to have a photograph taken. John is to stand at the back with the big boys. See how tall John is. The small girls stand in the front. See Fran stand in front of John. Fran says, What's that sticking in my back, John? John says, Sorry about that. It's my thriller. And it's the exciting part. Fran says, It's quite a thick book. Do you mind if I stand on it so that I'm in the photograph? Not at all, says John. Puts the book on the floor so Fran can stand on it. Kind John. Soon it's time to go home, and John puts his presents in his bag with presents and cards and a party bag with some cakes and sweets. When John arrives home, Janet is wrapping up some Christmas presents. Hello, Janet, says John. What an appalling little fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a nice time, says Janet. Yes, says John. There lots of party games, music, food and drink. We had all our photographs taken. I was standing behind Fran when Fran said, there's something sticking in my back. And I said, that's probably my Dick Francis. <laughs> she, she asked if she could hop onto it for some photograph. And that's why I have a funny look on my face. Do you know how to use up three rolls of sticky tape, a ball of string and five sheets of wrapping paper in just under two minutes? Janet does. See the big John-shaped present under the Christmas tree. Wake up to Rogan! Ho, ho, ho! This was a podcast from BBC Radio 2. Don't forget you can also download free podcasts for Steve Wright, Russell Brand and Chris Evans. Get more information now at bbc.co.uk slash radio2.